guys, welcome back. Today we're going to continue talking about stars. So last time we talked about the sun and all the characteristics of the sun. Remember our sun is just an everyday garden variety star. It just happens to be close to us, which makes it extremely important to us. So what I want to do for this session today is kind of give you a feel for what stars are, how we look at information from stars, looking at spectra, things like that. So let's talk about analyzing starlight, guys, because remember, every bit of the information that we have that comes from the stars out there comes from that electromagnetic spectrum. Now, you probably recognize the painter here. This is probably not the one most people think of. They think of the starry night. But actually, I like this painting of his a little bit better than I do starry night. I just think it kind of gives you a, a neater perspective. So I thought I would open with that today. So guys, let's talk about something called luminosity. And luminosity is the amount of energy per unit time. Well, energy per unit time is basically power that that star goes ahead and emits. Now, as I said, note, energy may be lost on its way to our eye. And that's certainly true because that starlight is going to come through, you know, all kinds of gas and dust. It comes through our atmosphere. So the brightness of that star, the energy per unit time or the power of that star, you know, certainly we may measure it something differently than it actually is. Luminosity is joules per second, which is a power. A lot of times people talk about a luminosity and they just kind of shorten it and they talk about, you know, the energy, but really it's luminosity, which is energy per unit time. And there is a direct relationship between the mass of a star and the luminosity of that star. And this is what that looks like. And notice, as you can see, that's a pretty straight line. So that means if I know the mass of, of a given star, assuming that star is doing what it normally is supposed to do, okay, so that's got to be said. A normal star. It hasn't started doing any of its evolutionary things. It's just a nice normal star, okay? Then I know the mass. I will then know the luminosity. If I know the luminosity, I then will know the mass. And so if I can look at that luminosity that's coming from that star, and yes, I see that it went ahead and went through some gas or dust or things like that, then I can either adjust that luminosity, or if I know the mass, I can figure out what the luminosity is, and I look at that star and I see a different luminosity. That then gives me a feel for how much gas and dust that light went through. Okay, so I can use that either way. But it is still a nice straight relationship, a nice linear relationship which makes it really nice to be able to work on stars. And this just basically talks about what I did. You know that luminosity is affected by distance simply because of the material that it's going through. And we know that luminosity decreases with the square of the distance from the star to the Earth. So if I back that star up twice as far, then I know my luminosity has gone down by four times. If I bring it twice as close, then I know my luminosity has gone up four times. If I do that in terms of a three, you know, three times out, three times closer, then I'm going to change my luminosity by about nine. Now, you can also talk about the brightness, and it's certainly related to the luminosity. But absolute brightness is basically how bright the star really is, and apparent brightness is how bright it appears to be when you see it from the Earth. And just like the fact there was a relationship between mass and luminosity, there certainly is a relationship between the star's luminosity and its average, excuse me, its absolute brightness and its apparent brightness. And all that goes back to where is that star relative to where we are and how much material is it going through before that light reaches us. Just a typical pattern of stars out there, guys. Unfortunately, you can't tell by looking at those stars which ones are closer, which ones are further away. I certainly see that there appears to be some of them that are larger and some of them that are smaller, but are those larger ones really large because they're really big, or are they just really large because they happen to be closer to the Earth? You know, we can't tell. That's why we really want to know what that luminosity is. Now, we have something called magnitude categories, and they're basically a mathematical relationship to brightness and each magnitude is going to represent a difference of about 2.5 times. When the magnitude scale was originally set up, they didn't account for things that um, could be brighter or dimmer. And so they originally set the scale up 
where it was at zero, but then they found things that were actually brighter, and so they had to go with negative numbers. And so on the magnitude scale, guys, the more negative the number, the brighter the star. Now, what we do with brightness and that absolute and apparent magnitude is I go ahead and I mentally take all the stars that I see out there and I put them at a distance of 10 parsecs. And that's going to give me then the absolute brightness or the absolute magnitude of that star. Everything is exactly in my mind at the same distance. Okay. Now, then I go ahead and look at the apparent brightness, and that will give me, like I said, a feel for where those stars are. And so those differences between the absolute and the apparent give me information on distance, dust, gas, all those kinds of things. Now, guys, if we think about what you can see with your eye, you can see down to about a magnitude 6. That's positive 6. Remember, guys, if it was a negative 6, it's going to be much brighter. So the more negative the number, the brighter the star. This just gives you some um, objects that we kind of are familiar with and the difference between the apparent and absolute. If we look at our sun, our sun is really, really, really close to us. So notice the apparent magnitude. Man, that's point, or excuse me, that's 26. That's extremely bright. But if I look at it at a distance of 10 parsecs, the absolute is only about 4.8, and that's a positive, not a negative. You know, so if we were pretty far away from the sun, that sun's not going to be real bright in the sky. We would be able to see it, but not by much. If I look at Cirrus, which is one of the brighter stars in our sky, it has an apparent of 1.5. It has an absolute of positive 1.4. So that 1.5 versus 1.4. Um, Rigel has a brightness of about zero. Well, it has an absolute magnitude of negative 8.1. So notice, guys, the fact that the absolute is really bright kind of gives you a feel for where Rigel is. As we talk through these stars, we'll come back to those really more important stars, the brighter ones, and look and see what their evolutionary sequence is, what are they like, where are they at that stage, and how far away they are from us. And you can see the other there. The moon and Venus, there's no absolute. We're just looking at the apparent there. And so you can see the moon is extremely bright with a negative 11. Venus is very bright with a negative 4. And then we can talk about something called photometry, and that's simply the study of an object's brightness. And the atmospheric conditions can certainly go ahead and affect the brightness of those objects. And so it's really nice if you're doing photometry, it would be nice to be able to do it outside the Earth's atmosphere. And so this is the same star, different nights. And you can see the one on the right, you're getting that nice star because the atmosphere is not moving very much. You may not be going through very much uh, atmosphere. Whereas, let's say you have the star on the left, same star, different night. You know, you have a lot of motion in the atmosphere. You may have a lot of clouds up there that are also helping to spread that light out. You know, that's not a good night to observe. The one on the right is a much better night to go ahead and observe. And then we have something called color indices. And it just means that we take a star and we look at three different parts of the spectrum and compare what they're doing in that. One of them is in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. One of them is in the blue part of the spectrum. And one is, is the yellow part of the spectrum. And then combining the different information from these filters gives us information on the star's true colors. Now, there is a law that you need to be familiar with that says the higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength at which the peak amount of energy is radiated. Okay, guys, what does that really mean? Okay. Well, I'm going to show you a graph here in just a minute, and hopefully that will help. Let me repeat it. The higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength, because remember, shorter wavelengths have more energy, and temperature is just a measure of the average amount of kinetic energy. So the shorter the wavelength, the more energy I have at which that peak amount of energy is radiated. And just in general, at hotter temperatures, more energy is radiated at all wavelengths. So let's look and see what this graph really shows. Notice that I have visible light down there. I have ultraviolet light down there at the top on the left. And then I have infrared. So now, guys, as I move from the left to the right, then I am decreasing my energy. 
and I'm moving toward longer wavelengths. Okay, because my wavelength is increasing as I go from left to right. Remember the lower wavelength, the, lower the, the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. So if I look at a star that's putting out its peak amount of radiation at about 2000 K, notice how high that peak is and notice how narrow that peak is. And so that's my very top one. And you can kind of see that in that dotted red line because that stands for the peak wavelength. Now, if I move down and I lower my temperature down to, let's see, 1750 K, well, I've lowered my peak wavelength, and not only have I lowered it, I have also caused it to move a little bit to the right, which means it's at a longer wavelength than a lower energy. Now let's go look all the way down to that bottom one at 1250K. Notice that red line has curved then to the right. Also notice that very bottom wave has spread out quite a bit, and it has certainly moved then to a longer wavelength. Okay, so I just want you to realize that, you know, as you decrease that temperature of the peak wavelength that the star is putting out, okay, the peak will get lower, it will move toward longer wavelengths, and it will spread out. And that's what Wien's law is. Now, we're not going to do a lot with that, but at least I wanted you to be familiar that it did exist. Now, we find out that cool stars are going to be brighter in the red and infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and hot stars are going to be brighter in the blue and the ultraviolet. Guys, that shouldn't come as any great surprise, because we know that the red and infrared regions are lower in energy than what the blue and the ultraviolet regions are. Okay, so it goes very well along with those red and blue stars. Here's Orion. And you can see we've got some red stars there. You can see we've got some blue stars there. The blue stars are obviously going to be hotter than the red stars. And as we've talked, our sun has a temperature of about 58 K, round that off to about 6,000 K. And so, as I've said before, it's putting out its peak wavelength in that greenish yellow region of the spectrum. So you've seen these kinds of pictures before of the sun. You've also seen these kind. I'm going to go ahead and change the wavelength of the light that I'm looking at the sun at, and so I get these different pictures. It gives me a feel for how much energy is going on. You know that this one is given in x-rays. It was the last time we saw these kinds of pictures in terms of what was going on within the sun. Remember the electromagnetic spectrum, guys? I've also got this posted on Blackboard for you. And we've got those three different types of spectra. We've got a continuous spectrum, an emission or a bright line spectrum, and an absorption or a dark line spectrum. Remember last time I also talked about what Cecilia Payne did, and I said she was looking at the abundance of the elements in the solar spectrum? Well, she was looking at these absorption bands. I just put that in there because I thought it was cool for a nice continuous spectrum. Notice that you're getting the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. You're putting those drops of water then on that colored sheet of paper, and you're getting then the spectrum in the drops of water. So now, this is a continuous spectrum. Notice the continuous spectrum does indeed run from the red end of the visible spectrum all the way to the violet end of the blue spectrum, the visible spectrum. Then emission spectrum, I have very distinct bright bands. Okay, and so that's why it's called a bright band spectrum or an emission spectrum. That means that energy has been given off from the gas that forms these. You're going to find out that a continuous spectrum is formed from a solid and a liquid, whereas the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum are formed from gases. And so now then, if I have an absorption spectrum, notice that I have black bands because that energy has been absorbed out as this continuous spectrum has passed through a cold gas, and so they're just missing, and that's why you see very distinct dark bands. Now this is kind of how you form them. You got for that continuous spectrum, you've got the filament within that light bulb. That filament heats up. That's a solid. You're giving off a nice continuous spectrum. 
If, however, I have a dark, excuse me, I have a hot gas, which means it's really energetic, those electrons have jumped up to outer energy levels, they then go ahead and spontaneously give that energy off as they jump back down to a lower energy level and every specific color that you see in that emission spectrum corresponds to an electron going from a high energy level down to a lower energy level. And so because you're jumping down to these very distinct shells or uh, clouds, energy clouds within the atom, then you get a very distinct colored band. Okay? And so there you're looking at it could be the emission spectrum of hydrogen, because every element and every combination of element will have its own very distinct emission spectrum. And so it's really nice then to go ahead and to identify lines within the spectrums. And then you can see I've got a cold gas, so I've got a continuous spectrum. That light from that continuous spectrum goes through a cold gas. That gas is really looking for some energy, so it absorbs the energy out corresponding to now the energy required for those electrons to absorb the energy and jump to an outer energy level. And so the absorption line spectrum that you see are the very dark bands where that energy has been absorbed out. Once that energy is absorbed out by that cold gas, that gas gets really hot now because it's excited, and it will then go back and spontaneously give off that energy, and the electrons will jump back down to the lower energy levels, and you'll get that emission spectrum given off. And we will see this kind of thing within the outer envelopes of the stars, and this is going to help us find out what's in that star, or at least certainly within the outer envelope of that star. So if I can look at the spectrum of a star, I can analyze the chemical composition. I can look at the chemical abundance. I can look at you know, the densities, the pressures, the temperatures, the rotational speed, the radial velocity toward or away from me. You know, the size of that star, I mean, it's a tremendous amount of information that I can go ahead and find out within the spectrum of that star. Now, this is a sun spectrum. And notice, guys, you have very distinct bands in there. And so this is what Cecilia Payne was looking at. And based on the fact that these distinct bands would correspond to particular elements or combination of elements like carbon dioxide, something like that, then she could look at that and determine what was in the sun spectra. And like I said, as you read, she certainly didn't believe it was really true. We certainly now know that it is. Now, I've got on Blackboard where I would like to actually go try looking at some of the spectras of these stars and you know, seeing if you could determine what kind of stars they are by looking at something called spectral classifications. And so check out on Blackboard where I've talked about spectral classifications. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to co practice and see if we can figure out what elements or what compounds are in the outer envelopes of that star. And we'll talk about why those nebulous materials are bright, what's happening to them. And so that's what I'm going to start with next is looking at consensus and distances within the galaxy and looking at stars, and then we'll start talking about how stars are made and what happens as they start evolving. So with that, guys, I'll see you next time.